I'm Michael Somino. I'm the coordinator of ethnic studies at Lane Community College, and I've been in uh, this role since 1999. And um, Lane Community College has the only comprehensive ethnic studies program in the state of Oregon for community colleges. And the lore uh, that was passed down through generations, uh, the claim was that Lane Community College was the first college of two-year schools, four-year schools, public schools, private schools, colleges, universities in the entire Pacific Northwest that we were the first to launch ethnic studies. And so I was kind of, over the years, I've been curious about that. And uh, so my sabbatical, uh, which uh, I did in fall of 2019, was to try to understand the history of the development of uh, ethnic studies at Lane Community College. So although I came to LCC in 1999, I arrived and uh, resurrected uh, a program that had started much uh, earlier and over, over the years had stopped. Um, but I also <clears throat> know that down the street at Oregon State University and the University of Oregon, those are the only two universities in the state of Oregon that have comprehensive ethnic studies departments. So it's really just the three of us um, that offer the complete uh, and wide range of ethnic studies courses. And um, so I was also curious about uh, how the other uh, institutions uh, manage their historical record. Uh, and because everybody has kind of their, their little shtick about you know, who were the first faculty and what were the first classes and when did they first teach them. And um, so ultimately my, uh, my sabbatical was wanting to look at how the other schools manage their institutional history, uh, meaning record keeping. Um, the second thing I was curious about was our history. And then the third thing that I wanted was to create a, a dedicated uh, file, I guess is a good way to put it, uh, in our archives. And one of the primary things that was unusual about my uh, sabbatical was that my sabbatical was completed on campus. And most of um, the significant parts of archives are locked away but in the kind of the public reading room space, that's where kind of anybody can go in and request documents. So uh, where I was working, there are these two huge oil paintings. And um, um, one is of a man in a suit and one is in a woman in a formal dress. And um, I used to refer to them as Mr. and Mrs. So I would walk in, I would greet them and then I would start doing my work. So I'd go pull files and I, would, I had little stacks, uh, initially starting by, uh, by year. So the 1960s and 70s and 80s or and things like that. And so when I would leave every night, I would ask uh, Mr. and Mrs. to not mess with my stuff, you know, like poltergeist style. One of the saddest, hardest things about trying to capture the history of really anything that has to do with uh, faculty or courses or, or really just anything that we do at the college, most faculty don't put their papers in archives. So all of those things are lost to history. So when I, when I was trying to do my work, you know, I had to look at board meetings. I had to look at the papers of presidents and vice presidents and executive assistants and then look at old uh, class schedules and course catalogs. And so it's, it's kind of sterile. That kind of history is, is sterile. It doesn't contain juice. It doesn't contain you know, excitement or drama or anything. It's just, I can, I can tell you exactly and precisely, here's when this ethnic studies course went to a vote and then it was approved. Nothing about the discussion in the meeting, nothing about any kind of controversy, nothing like that. And then I can point and say, here's exactly the moment in time in fall of you know, 1969 or whatever, where we launched this class. 
And then beyond that, there's really no, like I can't find uh, course syllabi. I can't find lecture notes from, uh, you know, the faculty. I can't find any kind of feedback from students. So, so partially it was that institutional memory uh, that's kind of sterile. And also what I didn't realize and that I know now is that when, when big boxes of documents land in archives, um, they, the boxes have already been edited by whoever puts things into a box. And then the archivist will go through the box and pull out kind of the most exciting things and then everything else just gets tossed aside. So there's multiple layers of editing that happens until, you know, to that moment in time where you have a formal box to now put in archives for people to look at. And so maybe those types of stories existed at one time, but, but they've been lost. My sabbatical concluded in December of 2019. Um, multiple things came out of it. One was a, a multi-page document that uh, kind of was a term-by-term -term summary of the creation of ethnic studies. It started as a black studies program in uh, fall of 1969. Uh, I, I created another uh, very large document that was essentially the institutional approach to the development of the courses. So it was all the kind of the committees and subcommittees and meetings where things uh, manifested themselves. And in the late 1960s, that included things like uh, ethnic studies, uh, the founding of the Multicultural Center, uh, kind of the support infrastructure for uh, various students of color, uh, a, the earliest kind of uh, manifestation of uh, work with uh, women and also veterans. So although I was focusing on ethnic studies, as I was digging through archives, I was really just kind of excited finding all these different aspects of the history of our college. Um, <clears throat> and the last thing I, I created was a dedicated box. You can actually go into archives now and you could see the box of documents of the founding of ethnic studies on our campus. And, um, um, and we have an electronic uh, trail. And, um, and actually, I'm not done with my research. I, uh, I am going to take some of the juiciest in, uh, historical documents and I'm going to digitize those and upload those so that anybody can go to Lane's website and see our, our work.